Welcome everyone to this year's BAA Historical Section webinar. Um, as usual, we're broadcasting on Zoom with a live stream to YouTube um, and the recording will be able to watch on our YouTube channel shortly afterwards, along with all our other uh, meetings and webinars. Um, also, as usual, you can ask questions by typing them into Q&A on Zoom or the comments on YouTube, and then we'll come to them at the end of the presentation. Um, over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Andy, and uh, much appreciated for uh, moderating our uh, our, uh, our webinar. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome along to the historical section uh, webinar for this year. Uh, my name is Mike Frost, and I'm the uh, the director of the historical section, BAA, British Astronomical Association historical section. Uh, welcome along to all BAA members who are uh, uh, who are uh, BAA section members who are here today. I'm sorry we can't have a a real world meeting just yet, but uh, hopefully we will be too long before too long. Hello to uh, all BAA members who aren't yet section members. Why not? Uh, please, uh, please let us know if you want to join our mailing list. And a special welcome to people who aren't yet uh, BAA members who uh, perhaps are, uh, are uh, uh, saw about our meeting because of the the adverts in astronomy now, Sky at Night, Sky, Sky, Tele, Sky at Night magazine. Um, it, it, if you if this um, uh, if this webinar uh, uh, it takes a fancy, then uh, uh, why not join our uh, our astronomical association? We are uh, very uh, uh, we have a lot to offer. Uh, we have uh, real world meetings. Uh, there's uh, one a week on Wednesday down in London and uh, various ones around the country. Had one in uh, Winchester and in uh, Leeds. One coming up in Nottingham and then up in Elgin in Scotland uh, later on in the year. Uh, we have our excellent journal. Um, it comes out six times a year, uh, newsletters, email alerts, uh, section newsletters, uh, uh, and uh, all sorts of section meetings and so on. So whatever it takes your fancy, uh, there is a lot in the BAA. Uh, if you've come along because you're interested in history rather than in astronomy, I'd also commend our sister organization, the uh, Society for the History of Astronomy. I know their chairman, Jared Gilligan, is, is, is logged in today. Uh, another great bunch of people, uh, Bill Barton, the, uh, the deputy director, and I are both founder members of the, the SHA. So uh, why not join both the, the BAA and the SHA? Um, so um, uh, as I say, this is a webinar. Uh, we It's two or three years since we last held a real world meeting. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd like to do so again in the future. Uh, but webinars are, are offer certain advantages. Mm -hmm. uh, people can, uh, can join from all around the world. And indeed, we can have speakers from all over the world. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure to welcome from Bangkok, Thailand, uh, our two speakers today, uh, uh, Dr. Wayne Orkjichen, who's the uh, adjunct professor of astronomy at the University of Southern Queensland, wide ranging interests, published 18 books and many research papers. He's former president of IAU Commission C3, managing editor of the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage, and Minor Planet 48471 is named after him. Isn't that great? And his wife, uh, Dar Mrs. Darani Lingling Olchiston, successful businesswoman from Chiang Mai in Thailand, doubles as Wayne's part time research assistant, special interest in Thai astronomical history and in Indian, Thai, Philippines, and New Zealand indigenous astronomy. Um, we were, uh, uh, Wayne advertised a whole series of talks to us, and uh, the one that uh, took our fancy was the uh, was about the eclipse of 1868. And it will be interesting. I know a little bit about this eclipse sort of from the Western perspective, uh, but it will be very interesting to find out about it from the Asian perspective. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to today's speaker, uh, starting off with Wayne. Thank you very much, Wayne. Well, Mike, thanks for that um, interesting intro. It's a delight for me to be here actually um, presenting at a BAA meeting, even if it's not in person. Um, so Darini Lingling and I were actually in Chiang Mai in the northern part of Thailand. But my uh, academic affiliation, as you can see on this slide here, is with the University of Southern Queensland, which is where I have my PhD students doing history of astronomy research. So I've taken the liberty of actually expanding the title of this um, presentation slightly by adding a subtitle a watershed event in solar physics, because I think that best characterizes what this particular eclipse is all about. And I've also, um, with the indulgence of Mike and um, the other organizers, I've also um, asked if we can have a little um, adjunct offhand quiz in the course of the presentation. So I've got eight different questions that relate to specific um, people or places or activities that are mentioned in some of the slides. And 
it's just a fun thing if you know the answer, write it down, and we can check at the end and see how many of the um, questions you got right. I don't want you to go and spend time looking up websites or anything like that. Just what you've got in your head and see how you go with that. Right, um, you're probably wondering about this slide. This looks really strange. We've got the title, we've got the speakers there, and um, what the lecture's all about, when it's on. Some pretty pictures there, but we've got um, faces, pluses, we've got arrows, we've got a solar eclipse, and we've got more pluses and pluses and arrows. So I'll let you puzzle about that, because we're going to come back to that, and this is actually going to be one of Mike's indulgences that I think you'll enjoy when we get to the end of the presentation. So let me just move on to tell you what we're going to be doing. And that's very strange. I'm not getting. Are you having a problem moving the slide forward? Ah, yeah, here we are now. Okay. No, it wouldn't, wouldn't go. OK, so let me just um, say what we're talking about. There'll be some introductory comments, this slide and the next one. And then after that, we'll talk about the astronomers who were involved in the 1868 and their instruments. We'll move on from there to talk about their observations. And then we'll go and look at some other aspects of eclipses to do with eclipse chasing with, and with astropolitics. So you'll come to realize that this eclipse is not all about science, even though it's the scientific breakthroughs that led to this being a watershed event in international astronomy. And we'll finish with number with number five some concluding remarks so just a little bit about us you've already heard about Darini Lingling and me but you're probably wondering well why am I based in Thailand and originally in Australia and New Zealand why am I doing research on a solar eclipse and to the, the transition from working on Australian and New Zealand astronomical history to solar eclipses, and specifically one observed in India, it was really quite interesting. Because in 2004, the International Conference of Oriental Astronomy had their fifth conference in Chiang Mai, Thailand. I'd never been to any of these because I'd never done any work on Asian astronomy. I was only working on Australian and New Zealand history. But I went along to that conference because I knew people there, and I ended up, for better or worse, being the proceedings editor. And when I went to canvas the various people who'd um, given oral papers and also prepared poster papers, there was a very interesting poster paper prepared by a Chinese gentleman from the US, Chen, and, from two, and by two Koreans, Lee and An. And it was about British observations made of the 1868 eclipse from Guntar in India. And I said, this is exciting stuff. Why don't you go and turn this into a research paper for me and we'll publish it in the proceedings? Well, they're all variable star people who sort of dabble in history on the side. And they had no real interest in this. They just wanted to give a paper and that seemed to be the easiest way to do it. But they didn't want to go beyond that. So they said, no, 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 we'll, we're not interested. And I said, well, I'm interested in solar eclipses, but I've never actually researched anything about them, let alone in India. Would you mind if I go and have a look at this and see if I can help turn it into a paper for you? So I did that and I wrote the paper, put my name last. They looked at it, said, this is ex exciting stuff. Um, there's only one thing wrong with it. You need to be the first author since you did all the work. And so I ended up publishing um, a paper co-authored by them in this proceedings. And you can see the uh, front cover of that book shown there. So that was how I got into eclipses. And that sort of led to studying other eclipses, but also um, carrying out research on the same eclipses, 1868 eclipse, not just in India, but also um, I realized it had been observed from Thailand or Siam as it was in those days. So that was interesting. Um, step forward now to 2014. I had just finished a job in Australia. I'd been offered a job in Chiang Mai here at the National Re Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand. And um, one of the things I wanted to do was carry out research on Asian astronomy, and particularly Thai astronomy. That was also when I met Daruni Lingling and we got married. And it wasn't long after that that I discovered that she was specifically interested in astronomy. She hadn't told me that, but she'd learned all about Lana astronomy, which is the regional astronomy from Northern Thailand from her father and grandfather. And she knew all about that. And she just assumed that everyone that lived in Northern Thailand knew that, but that's not the case. It's only people who normally live in villages, who are um, farmers, who um, 
go and observe the sky and have any knowledge of an interest in ethnoastronomers astronomy as we call it so this was a wonderful revelation to actually discover that she was interested in um, astronomy and when we started doing research together because i can't speak thai or read it she ended up being my research assistant and doing all the translations and interviewing people and then telling me what they said in english and taking photographs and this sort of thing so although she was working full-time running her business in a shopping center in Chiang Mai, she used to moonlight and do research with me. And that ended up being a major commitment by her to the point where she was working part-time as my research assistant. And she was um, going, carrying out archival research and attending conferences and seminars all around the world. And this map you can see here with all the green circles, those are places that we've been to to either attend conferences or give seminars or carry out research, archival research. Um, so it, we've gone around the world and recently because of COVID, we've gone around the world in, in a virtual way. So um, here we are in England, that's the large yellow dot. And then we've also um, given a presentation at the International Conference in Greece earlier this year. And this year and last year, we've given presentations in the US and also in Canada. Um, on a whole range of topics, but also ethnoastronomy, which she's very interested in, and we do a lot of work on, as well as basic um, history of astronomy. So that's the background. That's how I got into working on eclipses, and I've now studied a whole range of them, not just the 1868, and published papers on probably about a dozen different eclipses from a historical perspective. And Aruni Lingling has also got involved in um, non-ethnoastronomy. So she's been looking at the eclipse observations that we've done here in Thailand, and we've got papers jointly on that. And she's also been carrying out other research on the Jesuits um, who were involved in astronomy here in Thailand. So if you want to participate in the astro quiz I talked about, which is optional, the first question is, in what year or what about what time were the Jesuits active in astronomy here in Siam, Thailand. I just want the decade and the, the clue here, I don't want you going and looking up websites or anything, just guess or else if you know, fine. But the clue would be that it's about the same time as the Jesuits were carrying out um, astronomical work in China. And so China, India and Siam were all um, contemporary with this kind of work. And then it sort of died out rather quickly in Siam, Thailand, and a little bit later it died out in India. So everyone knows about China, but very few people know about the Jesuit work that um, was done here, which Darini Lingling and I have published quite a bit on. Okay, so let me move. So the first thing we should do in any introduction is not only introduce ourselves, but talk about the, um, the title of the, of the lecture and define some of the terminology. So we're talking about the 1868 solar eclipse. We can see the eclipse path there running from Aden to um, Melanesia across above Australia and near New Guinea. Um, it's a total solar eclipse. I don't need to tell you what total solar eclipse is about. Um, the path of totality is where you want to make the observations, obviously. It's got a duration of six minutes, 47 seconds. So this is my second question. Question number two, is a duration for a total solar eclipse of 6 minutes 47 seconds, is that a short one? Is that medium, average? Is that long? Or is it none of the above? So that's the second question. What does 6 minutes 47 seconds equate to in terms of solar eclipses? So we can see with this eclipse path that there were observations made on the um, western side from Aden, and then there were um, observations made at several places, not just two were shown there, but several different places in India. And then an observation made from Siam, which is now Thailand and southern Thailand. And then from um, right near the, uh, the sea coast of Borneo, which was British at that time, and then in Dutch East Indies, which is the extreme right hand of the different um, dots along the center line. The two locations that we're going to be discussing in this presentation are India so, and Siam, the two that are shown in red. And we've got expeditions, because this was an important um, solar eclipse, and we'll say so why in a minute, 
because it was a very important solar eclipse, we had expeditions sent out by the British, and there were uh, a number of them that went to India. We'll elaborate on that soon. Uh, the French sent an expedition to India, which we'll also be talking about with one of the British ones, and to Siam, and we'll be discussing that. Um, the, the Germans had an expedition in Aden at the very um, left end of the eclipse path, and they also had um, an observing party in India. And the Dutch East Indies, there was one expedition which we can see as the right hand of the um, yellow circles. We won't be discussing that. But all of these, almost all of these, have actually um, been written up by myself or other people. And right at the very end of the presentation, I'll provide you with um, a couple of pages of references. So anyone who's interested in a specific um, eclipse location and observations can just write, jot, can jot down that information and can follow up. And if you can't get the literature, I can you can email me and I can immediately send you a copy, so that's no problem. So why was this eclipse so important? I said it's a watershed event. Watershed event means it's something that's creating a major breakthrough in science in this case, and in this case in solar physics, because it occurred at a time when we had a whole change in the technology that was able to be applied to astronomy, not just to solar eclipses. We had the application of photography, so we could record permanent records of solar eclipses. We didn't rely on that very unreliable photon counter called the human eye anymore. And our memory, we had permanent records. The spectroscope had been introduced and applied to astronomy, so we could carry out spectroscopic observations of the eclipse, and we could work out what the chemical composition of the different components we see um, during eclipse were made up of. And then polariscopy also was introduced. This is a technique where you can use a particular instrument, instrument, a polariscope, to determine whether there's polarized light or not. And if there is, that will give you an indication of what the source of the emission is, whether it's, in this case, reflected sunlight or it's um, independently generated light on its own. So the key thing about that was we had these three different techniques that we could apply to solar eclipses. And this was also a seminal time in trying to understand what eclipses were all about in terms of what was the sun composed of. Because when we get a total solar eclipse, we lose the view of the photosphere and, and our sunspots, which we're so familiar with. And instead, we get a pink slight ring around the um, surface of the sun, which we call the chromosphere, and protruding from that in various places, we get prominences. We're going to see examples of those soon. And then extending out, and the prominence is also red in color, same as the chromosphere, and extending out beyond that, usually a silvery or whitish expansive light is the corona. And at this time, in the 1850s and through the 1860s, there was still a lot of controversy about the extent to which these three features, prominences, the chromosphere and the corona, to what extent were they actually associated with the sun? Or were they features of the Earth's atmosphere that we viewed during an eclipse? Or were they actually connected in some way with the atmosphere of the moon? So there was enormous controversy about that. And this eclipse, by um, applying the new technology of photography and spectroscopy and also polarized, looking at the polarized light, um, astronomers were able to make major breakthroughs and actually show that all three of those features, the chromosphere, prominences, and the corona, were associated specifically with the sun and with its outer atmosphere and its near inner atmosphere. So this really was a watershed event in solar physics. So let's now have a look at some of the astronomers who were involved. And I want to look at two different eclipse expeditions that occurred in India. And the first of these was the French expedition to India. There's also one to um, Siam, which we'll talk about a bit later. The French expedition was Janssen Jules, Janssen as he's known, or Pierre Jules César Janssen. We can see his birth death dates there. He was the one who was responsible for the founding of Meudon Observatory, which we can see on the right-hand side. Um, question number three. What was the size of the great Meudon refracting telescope? Okay. So 
Um, Janssen was responsible for the founding of the Meudon Observatory, which was the first astrophysical observatory built in France. And it was to apply the spectroscopy and photography in particular to not only solar physics, but also to the stars, gaseous nebulae, comets, and so on. So the idea of setting up Moodon Observatory was to have it as a counter to the traditional observatory that had been set up much earlier, Paris Observatory, which was very much in the non-astrophysics mould and did the old traditional astronomy. So César, um, uh, Pierre-Jules César Janssen was a remarkable figure. He had the ability to um, sell his his ideas and his eclipse expeditions and other research expeditions to the government to the point where, in fact, he ended up marginalizing the um, Paris Observatory's attempt to mount an eclipse expedition for the same eclipse. So he got the, the official funding. And when we look at um, his achievements, quite apart from this eclipse expedition, which we'll talk about in a minute, he was involved in carrying out some pioneering work um, on photography of the sun. And we can see a beautiful picture there on the bottom left. Um, some of these photographs that he took were made from Meudon Observatory, but he also realized that if he went high in the atmosphere, above the atmosphere, at, for example, to the top of Mont Blanc, which was the tallest mountain in France, um, and if you set up an observatory there, and you could somehow keep the snow away on the days when it wasn't snowing, you could make observations of the sun and also of the stars and make some major breakthroughs, which is what he did. And he made a number of expeditions up there. He set up this um, observatory right on the very near the summit of the, the mountain. And as he became older, he became less mobile. And we can see in the center bottom slide a picture of him being carried up the mountain to um, take part in further observations. So this was a really perilous event because um, they had to traverse crevasses and climb almost vertical rock faces. It was a major challenge, but he was committed to astronomy in a major, major way. So we've got um, Pierre Janssen, as he's best known, going to observe the 1868 eclipse from Guntar, which is site number two um, of the four sites that we can see marked in red. There are actually five of these different sites, and we'll see as we progress, we'll see the different expeditions that went to, um, to these. So this is Janssen, and the instrumentation, he was, as I said, very interested in spectroscopy. So he carried out spectroscopic observations of the eclipse, but one of the other things he did was develop what's called a photographic revolver. And this is a special kind of telescope where you've got a citostat outside the observing room there that directs the light from the sun into the um, into the photographic chamber there where you've got a rotating wheel and you can take a whole series of photographs in quick succession. And this was a technique that he developed specifically for the 18, um, 1868 eclipse and then perfected it further when it came to the 1874 transit of Venus. So he's more famous for carrying out his photographic observations of the 1874 transit of Venus, but he's well known for his spectroscopic observations of the 1868 eclipse. And we'll see more about that when we talk about the actual observations rather than the people and, the and their instruments. I want to go to um, another expedition also in India, and this involved Pogson and his um, Indian research assistant, Chari. So Norman Robert Pogson, we can see his birth dates there, was the first professionally trained astronomer at Madras Observatory. It had been founded in the um, 1790s, and he was appointed in 1861, and he worked from 1861 to 1891 as director. But he was the first of the professionally trained um, astronomers. The previous directors had either been amateur astronomers or they were surveyors who dabbled in astronomy. And originally the Madras Observatory was run by the British East India Company, and then it became a professional government-funded observatory. And of course, Pogson is well known for his work on the stellar magnitude scale that we use today. And he um, developed that while he was working in England. So he worked at three different observatories there before he became director at Madras. The first of these was George Bishop's observatory where he worked on comets and minor planets. So quest, the next question in our quiz, 
whereabouts was George Bishop's observatory located? Okay. And then he worked at Redcliffe Observatory, which is Oxford, and then Hartwell House Observatory. More about that in a few minutes. And he was director, as I said, at Madras. And one of the things that happened was that he was having a very difficult time with, um, with Airy, the Astronomer Royal in England. So my next question for you, those of you who want to do the quiz, is what were the Christian names of Airy? Two Christian names. Airy really didn't have much time for Pogson because Pogson came from the wrong class system. He was just middle class like me. He wasn't one of the highbrows. And what's more, he made the terrible mistake of going and studying astronomy and mathematics in Germany instead of going to England. And like our friend Mike Frost, going and doing a major in mathematics at Cambridge University. And of course, Airy was a Cambridge man. So whenever Pogson tried to get um, promotions in England or tried to claim a directorship, um, Airy would block him. And this continued after Airy finally relented and wrote a rather damning um, reference for, for Pogson when he applied for the directorship of Madras. Um, but John Herschel wrote an even better one and that countered Airy's negative comments. And so um, Pogson ended up at Madras Observatory. And when he was there, he carried out a, um, a major survey of stars of the southern skies. And he also was involved in solar eclipse expeditions, not just this one of 1868, and also the major 1874 transit of Venus expedition. Um, Airy all the way through tried to block whatever Pogson was doing to the point where Pogson was totally ignored. And when it came to organizing a British expedition to carry out observations, the 1868 e eclipse from India, um, Airy appointed someone else and organized a totally different expedition and got funding from the Royal Society and also through his own Royal, Ast Royal Astronomical Society and the Royal Observatory to support and fund that other expedition. We'll talk all about that in a minute. So it was very, very difficult for Pogson to actually carry out research on this eclipse. And the only way he did so was because when there was a lot of politics going on in 1867, the government of India said that they wanted to also set up a meteorological superintendent for the whole of India. And they decided to appoint Pogson to that position. So he had two positions. He was director of the observatory. He was superintendent of meteorology for India. And when it came to mounting an expedition to observe the 1868 eclipse, he couldn't get any support at all from England and through Airy but he was able to use the excuse of setting up a meteorological observatory at the site where we wanted to carry out the solar observations of the eclipse. And so he convinced the government of India to fund that meteorological observatory and the eclipse expedition. So he was a smart guy, but he was born on the wrong side of the tracks and he was educated in the wrong part of the world. So he went to Masulipatam, which we can see there is um, eclipse site number one, right near the coast, and very close to number two, which is where um, his Bat Noir that we'll see in a minute, Tennant, and also where our friends from France uh, were based. So let us, before we do that, though, we go and have a look at the second part of the Madras Observatory expedition. Originally, they wanted to have four different um, field stations, and they thought that there would be funding from England so that they would get support for that. But they could only actually fund two through the um, through this expedition and meteorology that I was talking about. So Riganathachari was the person who was responsible for the second site, which was at Vunpuni, which is um, site number three there, what we can see. And he followed his father, and when he was young, still a teenager, became an assistant at Madras Observatory. So he actually served during the time he worked there, from 1847 to 1880 when he died. He served under five different directors. He learned his astronomy through them. He knew nothing when he began. He was just simply basically a janitor. Um, but he learned his astronomy. He ended up 
being very, very competent, in 1864, he was promoted to first assistant, a position that would normally be um, taken by, be held by a professional astronomer's training in astronomy. In 1872, in, um, as a reaction to the work that he did on the Southern Star Catalogue from Madras and his observations of the 1861 1871 and 1868 eclipses, um, he was appointed a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. He observed the 1874 transit of Venus. Again, he ran a um, separate expedition there on behalf of, um, of the observatory. He was the first Indian astronomer to publish a paper in the monthly notices of the RAS. And he was the first Indian to discover variable stars and publish papers about them. But as well as carrying out research astronomy, he was also interested in Western astronomy. And he was interested in promoting that and showing that Western astronomy provided you with a much more realistic assessment and evaluation and view of the universe than the traditional astrological systems that were promoted by the, um, uh, the traditional astronomers of India. So he was out to try and popularize Western astronomy and he ran public observing sessions from home and he went and published the Indian equivalent of the nautical almanac, things that we call Panchanga, um, in various languages. And he also went and wrote up books and booklets in local languages um, about different important astronomical events. So here um, beside Chari on to his left, we can see the cover of the Urdu um, version of the 1874 Trentative Venus book that he wrote. So a very, very fascinating man and someone who um, has actually been recognized in the annals of international astronomy. So this is wonderful. He was the, the leading Indian astronomer of the British colonial period. The instrumentation, Pogson, as we can see, just had three small telescopes and he had no access to photographic equipment. So um, he had um, spectroscope, which had been provided by um, Huggins. So this is my next question. Sir William Huggins, where was his observatory located? Okay. So Huggins supplied um, a telescope. In fact, Huggins supplied two, five and a, two, two and a half inch telescopes. He provided a micrometer, a spectroscope and a polariscope. And the largest of the three refractors that Pogson had access to was provided by Lee. And we can see Sir John Lee down there to the left of William Huggins. And Lee was the astronomer who ran Hartwell House Observatory, which we can see a photograph of um, immediately above. And this was one of the observatories that um, our friend Pogson worked at before he moved out to India. And as well as that, um, Pogson had chronometers and unfortunately there were scattered clouds, but they did, did make some very, very useful observations between the clouds, including some spectroscopic observations that really were first rate, as we'll see in a few minutes. Um, Raghunath Achari, he had access to an even larger telescope than his um, boss, Pogson, a four inch. Um, and that was actually a telescope that was built specifically at Madras Observatory using a Doland, an old Doland lens, and then creating a telescope from it, so a tube assembly and equatorial mounting. And that was a, supplied with a micrometer. And he also had a two and a half inch cook from the observatory and micrometers. And he also had intermittent cloud, um, worse than Pogson, and didn't make as many useful observations. And we can see that these these instruments came in the main from England. They came from the friends of Pogson. And this was because, as we already um, stated, Madras Observatory had been marginalized by Airy. So let's move on and see what Airy was interested in doing. <coughs> Airy decided to support Major James Francis Tennant to run a, the official British expedition um, and Tennant, we can see his birth death dates. He was um, of Scottish ancestry, but was born in India. He was educated locally and he was a soldier um, astronomer who spent most of his time in the army, but he also 
was then involved in the trigonometrical survey of India, and for a short time, immediately before Pogson became director, he was the um, acting director of Madras Observatory. Um, after um, leaving the trigonometric survey, he worked at the Royal Mint until where he retired in 1882, and then he returned to England. And for, a, for one session, he was president of the RAS, so he's very active in England as well. And as well as observing this eclipse and running the expedition on behalf of the Royal Observatory, the Royal Astronomical Society, and the Royal Society, he also observed and ran an expedition for the 1871 total solar eclipse that was also visible from um, India. And this beautiful um, picture at the top right is one of my favorites of all eclipse expedition pictures. This is taken from the Illustrated London News of them preparing to observe the 1871 eclipse. As well as that, Tennant was involved in the 1874 Trent of the Venus. He ran a, a major British program on that too. So his observations um, were carried out at site number two. Um, so he was uh, just a hundred meters along the road from where um, Jansen was carrying his observations and they pulled some of their resources for that. And as I've indicated, all of the instrumentation um, for this expedition of, of 1868, um, Tennant's expedition was provided by Airy. So let's have a look at the instrumentation. Well, rather impressive. So we can see on the right hand side here, we've got a Browning width reflector. And we can see the camera attached to the um, telescope mounting, to the eyepiece mounting. So my next question of that, for those of you who are um, answering the quizzes, a Browning width reflector was made of various components by which people. So what did width make? What did Browning make? So if you want to put that together, which are the Browning components, which are the width components of that telescope? Forget about the camera and just look at the telescope and mounting and tube assembly. So there were two telescopes. There was that one there, which we've just talked about, which was used for photography. And there was a 4.6 Cook refractor that was used to carry out polariscopic observations to look at the, um, the polarized light from the, from the sun. There was a repeating circle, which was used for time measurements. And there were spectroscopic and polariscopic um, instruments, as I've just said. So we've got a couple of pictures here on the left um, showing the different tent observatories that was set up for the equipment. And in the foreground, we've got some of the local Indian assistants helping with the expedition observations. And the expedition, expedition was camp was based at the um, headquarters of one of the British um, British expats living in India. And so the diagram at the bottom left um, shows the location of the various observing um, instruments relative to the house and um, farm buildings. We're only talk going to talk about those two expeditions that were made by the British in India and the one French but there were actually other British teams that were formally um, recognized and were funded from England through Airy and again at the expense of Pogson. So one of those two expeditions was led by the son of Sir John Herschel, Lieutenant John Herschel, or John the Younger. And he worked for the Trigonometrical Survey of India. And on the right hand side, we can see the different transects that were made in the course of that trigonometrical survey to record trig stations across the full east west expand and then the northern north to south extent of India in the course of um, a, a period of many decades. And my next question for those of you who are interested in questions, and this is actually the last one, is who was the most famous director? of the Trig Trigonometrical Survey of India. So Sir John Herschel, sorry, John Herschel, Lieutenant John Herschel's expedition was funded for funded and mounted by the Royal Society. So instrumentation was provided by them. And their observing site was Jam Candy, which was number four, which we can see there on the map at the bottom. There was another expedition. This was actually one that was formally mounted by the um, Trigonometrical Survey of India, and it was led by um, Captain Haig from the Royal Engineers, 
who had trained also as an astronomer. And their observing site was number five. We can see that there on the list of observing sites. And <clears throat> as well as that, there was an in a German team carrying out observations, which we won't be talking about either, led by Professor Frederick Tischen. And um, that was funded by the German government, and they carried out their observations from a site, um, Malwa, which is very close to Bijapur, which we can see as site number five. So no more about those, but at least you know they exist, and there's been some material written up about them, but we have more to do on those um, in later research. If we now move on to my part of the world, Siam, or Thailand as it's now known, the second French expedition was there. And this was one that was mounted by Paris Observatory, but unfortunately by the time the director of Paris Observatory decided to get off his butt and go and lobby the government for funding, they said, too late, my boy, too late, we've given all our money to Janssen. So Paris Observatory ended up getting an enhanced funding allocation for that for, for the next year, and they ended up spending the great bulk of that funding for to mount an expedition to Siam because the director of the observatory was determined that he wouldn't be outdone by this upstart in astrophysics called Janssen. And um, so they sent an expedition. He sent an expedition on behalf of Paris Observatory in response to an invitation received from the king of Siam. And we'll talk more about this king known as King Rama IV later, because he's an interesting character, as we'll find out. So the two lead astronomers on the French expedition to Siam were Jean-Marie Edouard Stéphane, who used to work at Paris Observatory, but just before the eclipse, two years before the eclipse, he transferred to Marseille Observatory and um, transferred it to a new site. And then after the eclipse, he came back, he became director there, and then ultimately he was professor of astronomy at University of Marseille. And he's very well known for his um, pioneering work in carrying out interferometry on the diameters of stars. But uh, for most of us, um, rather than that, you would think of him in terms of Stefan's quintet, which we can see the a beautiful picture at the top right. That, of course, is not the view he saw of the quintet um, back in the 1870s, 80s, when he was observing in black and white and with much smaller instruments than we now have access to. But um, Stefan is the left hand of the two fellows that we can see here in the middle, and to his right is Rayette. So Georges Antoine Ponce Rayette. Um, he worked at Paris Observatory at the time of the expedition, and he later on became professor of astronomy at Bordeaux. And he's famous um, not just for carrying out the first spectral observations of a nova, but also of discovering with Wolf the Wolf Rayet stars. And one of the things about Rayet was that he became a, an international expert in spectroscopy, but in stellar spectroscopy, not in solar spectroscopy. And that would have a profound effect upon the outcome of their expedition to Siam. So before we move on to the next slide, just um, you're probably wondering what that pretty picture is at the bottom right. That's an example of a wolf riot star um, taken in color with recent instrumentation. So where did these fellows observe and what do they observe with? Their instrumentation really quite impressive for the time. So a 40 centimeter reflector, which was built by Foucault and Secretan in 1859. So a lot earlier than the actual Eclipse expedition. And this was one of the largest telescopes in France and in the world, in fact, at that time. And Foucault, of course, is well known for his um, work on the Foucault pendulum. He's famous for that, but we must not forget that he and Secretan were also equally famous in the astronomical world of the second half of the 19th century as pioneer telescope makers. So that telescope already existed at Paris Observatory. It just had to be had the equatorial mounting modified so that it could um, work from a low latitude um, here in Siam. Um, there was a second telescope taken there, which was um, made specifically by Martin, who was one of the um, instrument makers in Paris, worked for Paris Observatory some of the time. And he made that instrument a 20 centimeter, eight inch reflector 
um, in 1868 specifically for this expedition. And we can see on the bottom right a close-up of it. So you can see this makeshift wooden equatorial mounting. You can see a wooden um, tube and a wooden plate holder. And notice the equatorial mounting. This gives you an idea of just how close to the equator um, this site in southern Thailand or southern Siam was. And then if we look at the picture on the um, left-hand side, this is a view showing the eclipse expedition camp for the observers, not for the observing party, not for the um, residents. And um, we can see three different sheds that were set up for, for the different instruments, but the two reflecting telescopes um, were too large to comfortably fit in those, and so they were set up outdoors. So right at the um, in front of the left hand of the three um, buildings you can see on the right hand, on the left hand side, um, you can see the 40 centimeter and there in the middle we can see the 20 centimeter. And as well as that, um, to go with them, um, with the instruments, we had three spectroscopes made specifically by the leading um, spectroscope, spectroscope maker in France at the time, Du Bosque. And there were two polariscopes to um, examine polarization of light. There were clocks, chronometers to record the time. So let's now look at the observations that were made. So photography was very successfully carried out by Tennant. And he published a, a long paper, which has a series of photographs. And we can see two of those shown here. I've overlapped them so that you can see the um, prominences around the right-hand edge of the moon around the moon and the sun on the um, right-hand side um, on the top one. And then on the left-hand one, you can see this um, near the beginning of the totality. You can see this very, very large prominent, prominence, which they called the Great Horn, which we'll talk more about in a minute. So photography clearly um, showed prominences. And of course, the photography was in black and white in those days. It showed the prominences and it showed clearly the chromosphere. And then Pogson's party carried out observations, um, and they were able to show that the, the light from the corona was polarized. And I've got a quote here taken from one of the um, observing team in Pogson's party. The light from the corona was polarized and shines chiefly at all events by reflected light. We may conclude that the corona is caused by an atmosphere surrounding the sun and reflecting the sun, the solar light, end of quote. So this proved once and for all that the corona was part of the sun. And similar results to that um, were obtained by other astronomers that carried out observations of this eclipse using polariscopes. So photography and polaris polariscopy were both very successful, but the real spectacular results came from spectroscopy. So Pogson, between the gaps in the clouds, and they must have been quite substantial because he made some very, very telling observations, was able to observe the prominences with his um, telescope, with spectro spectroscope attached, and he detected seven emission lines. And we've got, um, in the drawing on the right, we've got at the top of the two strips, we've got um, drawings a drawing by him showing one, two, three, five of the seven most intense um, emission lines. And then below that, in color, we've got the, um, the lines of what are thought to be the relevant um, elements, but as Fraunhofer absorption lines, not emission lines for reference purposes. So the line that's critical here is the one that is almost directly above the D line. But when Pogson carried out his analysis, he made the point that actually it wasn't aligned with the D-line. So he suggested that this is actually due to another element. This is not caused by sodium, which is the element that generates the D-line. Pogson then went and wrote up a detailed account of his observations and also those that were carried out by Chari at um, Vumpuni. And he wrote this account, which was published in 1869, report of the government astronomer upon the proceedings of the observatory, that's Madras Observatory, in connection with the total eclipse of the sun on August 18, 1868, as observed at Masulipatam and Vunporte 
Madras and other stations in southern India. It was published by the Madras government and it was published in Madras. But Airy was determined to try and block any publicity of positive results that Pogson may have obtained. So this publication, which was meant to have been produced in multiple copies and distributed to astronomers and observatories around the world, was delayed extensively. It was delayed for over a year. And when it finally was um, published, funding was only allocated to print three copies. Three copies, not 30 or 100. And those three copies were kept at Madras Observatory and by the government. So no one except the astronomers at Madras Observatory got to find out what they had actually done and achieved and discovered in the course of those observations. As well as that, of the seven emission lines, we've not only got the sodium D line, but later analyses revealed that one of the other two lines that's not shown in that um, black strip with the five emission lines, one of the other two was the, um, was the green iron line called the coronium line, which was discovered later independently by other astronomers as a later eclipse. It actually also was discovered in 1868 by Pogson and is mentioned and is discussed in this report, which no one's ever seen or heard of until um, my collaborator, Beeman B. Nath, who wrote a book about the discovery of helium and Pogson's involvement in it, went and accessed all of the archival material, found this report, found all of the original observations, found the beautiful drawing that we can see here, and went and was able to document all that and show the true story. So Pogson discovered two emission lines, neither of which he was given credit for, and Airy made a point of blocking Pogson from publishing anything. So Pogson never was able to publish a research paper in any of the British journals, which is where he should have been publishing um, on this work. He should have been publishing in um, monthly notices of the RAS. Um, but of course, he, he wouldn't have been able to because um, Airy would have blocked that. Airy would have been the referee and would have said, this is garbage, this is written by Pogson, Th throw it in the bin where it belongs, which is totally wrong. Um, what I wonder, and what um, Beeman Nath and I have said in, in, the, one of the, in the paper that we've written about this, is that um, it's just a great pity that Pogson didn't go and publish in an international journal that had nothing to do with, with Airy. So he could have written a two-page account reporting about the emission line observations and published it in Astronomisch Nachrichten or in, uh, in an Italian journal, perhaps somewhere. So at least it would have got international exposure instead of nothing. But of course, at that time, he was expecting that his book, his 19, what became the 1969 book, would be published and would be distributed all around the world. So um, everyone would become aware of what was achieved. This is a great, great travesty of justice and a great disaster for solar physics that in fact, he wasn't given the credit that was due to him. Um, and if you read the work that um, Beeman has, Nath has written in his book and read our paper about the 1868 eclipse observations, I think you'll be fascinated to learn the truth about Pogson and about Madras Observatory and the way in which Airy, who achieved so much as Astronomer Royal, also was able to achieve so little when he blocked people who deserved full credit and support. If we move on and have a look at emission lines, the other person, as I said, who was an expert on, on spectroscopy was Rayette. And he was the second in charge of um, Stefan's expedition to Siam, to Thailand here. And he carried out observations, spectral observations, and he actually beat um, Pogson. He detected eight emission lines, but he didn't identify any of those as new emission lines. When he looked at the um, D line, the uh, emission line near the absorption line D1 of sodium, he just assumed that this emission line was caused by sodium. And what I suggest here, what Daruni Lingling and I have suggested in the paper that we've written up about this expedition is that um, Rayet was not party to the discovery of helium. 
Without doubt, this missed opportunity arose because of his unfamiliarity with stellar, sorry, his familiarity with stellar as opposed to solar spectra. Had he made the connection that he'd discovered a new spectral line, his name would now be much better known as the co-discoverer of helium than as the discoverer of wolf riot stars. I think that's a fair comment. So here we've got the different spectral lines that he observed. And below that, we've got a table which was assembled by Young in 1902 when he was able to actually correlate the different lines with the different um, elements. And he's got the wavelengths um, listed there. So Rayet did some interesting work, but he wasn't a solar astronomer and he missed the opportunity. Pogson wasn't really a spectroscopist, but he made the observations. He came to the right conclusions, but he was never able to publicize that. So sad. Okay, as well as the spectroscopic, photographing polariscopic observations, we also had drawings. So there was a, still a place to carry out drawings, make drawings. And we've got examples um, here of three drawings of the eclipse made by Stefan from Siam. And we can see those in the, um, on the right. And you can see that they're taken a little bit of time apart. And the only major difference is the, the, um, the corona is pretty much the same, but we've got um, prominences are different sizes and slightly different shapes in the course of the three, um, three observations, which would have been made during the six minutes, um, 46, was it, seconds of totality. And below, on the left, we've got a drawing by Pogson showing the prominences. Um, and he's got a whole limb full of them instead of just one or two sticking out like that. And he's also indicated what he thought the corona looked like, but um, the coronal um, streamers and extensions are, uh, don't mirror very well those that have, are drawn by Stefan. So Pogs might not have been a talented artist, but he was a very good spectroscopist. And then we've got this rather beautiful picture here that I've got on the right-hand side, which actually was drawn by Jean Borde, who's one of the officers on the French vessel, which we can see in the bottom right there, which brought the French expedition out to Wakawa in Siam. And he made this um, drawing showing the, the sun during totality in some of the um, different vessels anchored off Wakawa, the site in southern Thailand, where the observations were made. More about that site shortly. And as well as that, there's this drawing of this big prominence that I talked about, the Great Horn. This was fascinating to, um, to, Pen to Tennant and to some of the other British observers from India. They make all sorts of comments about it and they measure its height. So it was found to be um, a bit over 140,000 kilometers high. And when they went and looked in detail at it, they felt that they could detect quite detailed structure. And one of the things that um, they were doing was trying to work out, well, not only what is it, what is its composition, but actually how is it operating? And at that time, there was no knowledge about um, the solar magnetic field. So we didn't understand that prominences followed magnetic lines of force between sunspots, for example. Um, and they thought that this was some kind of ejection event that was drilling its way out into the atmosphere from the surface of the sun. And so what they were doing in, in that kind of analogy was looking for evidence of rotation. And some of the observers, when they're commenting about the Great Horn, they talk about um, they thought they could detect evidence of rotation in that horn. Well, of course, that's nonsense. But that was the um, theory at the time. You can understand them thinking that way. So those are the drawings. And then, oh, sorry, we're going the wrong way. <clears throat> and then there was one other drawing which had nothing to do with the actual appearance of the sun itself, but I found rather interesting because it's talking about a phenomenon which is only really observed at um, solar eclipses. It's only been seen a few other times. And this was observed from Waka. So this is in, here in Thailand and Siam. And someone from Saigon, one of the French naturalists, uh, Monsieur Pierre, and I'm not sure whether Pierre is his Christian name or his surname. He's only referred to as Monsieur Pierre. 
Um, he viewed the eclipse from the summit of a mountain near to where the French expedition was. So he's, um, he's up about um, one and a half thousand meters and he's observing the eclipse. Um, he's got no bother with clouds and he gets a very good view. And what he notices is when he's observing, it remains for me to tell you of the luminous bands, which I observed 11 times during the course of the eclipse. Moon had covered two thirds of the sun, so it wasn't totality yet when they began to appear on the horizon. So they're not where the sun and the eclipse has taken place, they're down on the horizon. At first I counted three of them, then seven, which was the maximum number I saw. They were perpendicular to the horizon and parallel to one another, and each appeared about 40 centimeters in width. That's of course relative to where he's observing from. They appeared and disappeared with the undulations of the atmosphere, but they always reappeared at the same point on the horizon. That's interesting. They were all, they were not all of the same brilliance. They covered all the colors of the rainbow. So they went from red through to purple violet. It seemed to me that from the right to left, that is from north to south, these bands varied in color and intensity. Thus the one on the south, and I can't read this because I've got the, um, I've got the sharing screen stuff here, but you can read the rest of that. So he talks about the, um, the sequence of colors there. And I've quoted there from Stefan's um, publication and monograph that he um, included this account in. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. When I went and looked, uh, looked at this, I found that uh, there are a small number of other eclipses with this phenomenon, which obviously has to do with atmospheric effects, nothing to do with the eclipse itself, I suspect. Um, it's been reported at a number of other sites. So let me now move on and take us away from the scientific observations, but we're going to go back to Wakoa in Thailand anyway, and <clears throat> I want to talk about eclipse chases and astropolitics. So this is about non-scientific astronomy, even though, as we'll see, there's been some attempts here in this section to do science. And the key player in all of this is King Rama IV. So he was born in 1804 and he died in 1868. Oh, immediately you say, oh, same year as the eclipse. Yes, we'll see that's the case. And we've got a picture of him here at the top left. And he was interested in learning about Western culture. He believed that he, if he could Westernize and modernize Siam, um, that would help with the development of the country and its um, expansion and its, um, its development. So he was very interested to um, learn about Western culture, society, legal aspects, and that sort of thing, and particularly astronomy. And he had Western tutors um, teaching him about various areas of science, including astronomy, which he became fascinated by, about because he'd already learned about astrology, astrology as a Buddhist monk. Um, he had to go through the monkhood, and um, that was one of the areas that he learned. But then he starts learning about astronomy as opposed to astrology. And um, he ended up using a whole range of Western books, including um, Sir John Herschel's Outlines of Astronomy, the 1859 edition. And there on the right, um, there's my own copy of that very same edition that he had that he learned astronomy from. And he ended up doing things that were quite unusual to show his... Um, his commitment to astronomy as a hobby, he ended up decorating um, one of the Buddhist temples that was built in, in Bangkok, um, decorating it with astro Western astronomical motifs instead of traditional Thai astrological or non-astrological motifs. So we can see some pictures here um, across the middle there of total solar eclipse of um, Jupiter with its four Galilean moons and of Saturn. And we can see those there. One of the other things that he did was to set up a national time service. This was the first country in the world, Siam was the first country in the world to set up a national time service. Other places like England had a national railway service from the 1840s or 50s, but there wasn't a national time service for the country. Each city had its own time service. And Thailand was, Siam was the first place to have a national time service. New Zealand, just a few months later, also in 1968, was the second. And the reason that Rama IV set, King Rama IV set up that time service was so that there would be a national time service that could be linked to international time that could be used by the astronomers, including himself, observing the 1868 August 18 eclipse. 
And he made that national time service available to those who lived in Bangkok and were able to go anywhere near the palace by building this multi-storey um, clock tower, which you can see on the extreme right, adjacent to part of the Royal Palace complex. And you can see a large clock um, up the top of the tower. And in fact, there were four clock faces. So you can look from all of the cardinal directions and you would be able to see what the time was. And as well as that, King Rama IV was interested in promoting astronomy as opposed to astrology. So he tried to teach astronomy to the um, court astrologers and show them the difference between astronomy and astrology. And that when it came to mathematical things like calculating the location, um, the path of totality of an eclipse, you could do this much more accurately using Western data than you could with traditional Thai data. But he was also interested in trying to get the public of, of Thailand, of Siam, to understand more about the nature, the real nature of astronomical events and objects. So he went and published a whole series of newspaper articles and um, sent out pronouncements relating to eclipses, um, to eclipses of the sun and the moon, um, of comets and so on, where he would talk about what the real astronomical um, basis of these things was, as opposed to the astrological, to try and break down the superstition that was found throughout Thailand as part of the Buddhist religion. So he was an interesting, enlightened fellow, and he walked a tightrope between astrology and astronomy. And what he did was, as a result of um, his, his um, studies of astronomy, he realized that there was going to be an eclipse of the sun with the path of totality passing through Thailand, through Siam, southern part of, of Thailand, um, on the 18th of August, 1868. He worked out where the path of totality is, and we can see the diagram at the top there showing the location. So it's um, the, the site where he wanted to observe from has got the red bullseye. And below that, here are some of his calculations working out the location of the path of totality. And here we've got him on the left, um, <clears throat> draw um, in the official royal attire, accompanied by his son, who became King Rama V after his father died, and was also involved in astronomy, interested in astronomy, and also supported European eclipse expeditions soon after. But what Rama IV, what the father decided to do, was to observe the eclipse from, an, from a camp at the site called Wakoa, and he invited the uh, French to observe from there. And he also decided to use that eclipse to educate us called astronomers and the citizens of Siam. So invite them in en masse to come and see this eclipse. And <clears throat> here on the bottom photograph, we've got the king um, set up in one of the um, complex of buildings that they established at Wakoa. So they had a, a major eclipse camp, eclipse camp for him, and they had two other eclipse camps, which one of which was for the French expedition that we've already talked about. The third eclipse camp was for Harry Ord that we'll talk about in a minute. Because the third thing that King Rama IV wanted to do with this eclipse was to use it to confront what I call the whale and the crocodile. What? What does that have to do with astronomy? Whale and crocodile? I know you're wondering about that. So what's this whale? What's this crocodile? All right, have a look at this map. So here we've got Siam, it's brown, present day Thailand. And it extends, it's a long skinny country, and it extends from the, um, from the north where we've got it adjacent to what is now called Ma'amwa, but that used to be Burma. So Burma was a British colony at that time, and immediately to the east, sorry, to the west of Burma, we had what is now Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. So we've got this whole swathe of British colonies um, immediately to the west of Siam. And then below Siam, we've got the Malaysian states and we've got British North Borneo, all of these British, so shown in pink and red. So here we've got to the west and to the south of Siam, we've got the British looking longingly and hungrily at Siam, which had lots of minerals, 
gemstones, teak, and lots of other resources that would be attractive to um, colonial powers like the British and the French. And the French, there they are, immediately to the, to the east of Siam. So French Indochina, or Cochin China, as it also was known. So the French are to the east, the British are to the west and to the south, and both of them are eager to take over Siam and turn it into a colony. Um, there are other colonial powers around. So we've got the Philippines, they were occupied by the Spanish. And then further to the south of that, we've got the Dutch who occupied the Dutch East Indies, which are now, of course, known as Indonesia. But the real problem lay with the French and the British. They were both ex ex exerting enormous political and economic pressure within Siam and pressuring the king to try and accept protection. And in 1863, France was forced, forced independent Cambodia, which is next door, immediately next door to the east of Siam, to accept protection from France and become a French protectorate. This caused a dilemma for, for Rama IV. And so he said at this time, since we are now being constantly abused by the French because we will not allow ourselves to be placed under their domination, like the Cambodians, it's up for us to decide what we're going to do, whether to swim upriver and make French friends with the crocodile, that's the French, or to swim out to sea and hang on to the whale. That's the British, end of quote. So you've got the choice. Do you befriend the crocodile or you do the or do you befriend the whale? Well, Rama IV was a very astute guy. He decided he'd befriend the crocodile and the whale. And he decided to do that, do that by using the eclipse as a political weapon. So he invited the French astronomers to carry the observations of the eclipse from Waka, his own, where he had his own compound. And he also, and he provided them with beautiful um, compound with um, extensive lodgings, with all the buildings required for the instruments, and provided food and beverages bringing the very best that he could from, from places like Singapore, not just from local food, provided them with lavish support. But he also decided that he would counter that by inviting the most senior British diplomat who existed in the whole of Southeast Asia, and that was Harry Ord, who was the first um, governor of the what was called the Strait Settlements and was based in in Singapore. And he invited Sir Harry Ord, or Harry became Sir Harry soon after the eclipse. Be he invited Harry Ord to join him and become part of the official party at Waka. And he built a separate complex, um, a magisterial complex for Harry Ord at Waka. So you've got the three expeditions there. And here we've got a photograph that was taken um, by the French expedition showing some of the vessels that were anchored off Waakoa where the eclipse camps were. Altogether, you can't see all of them because they're not clear in this picture, but I, in the original, I was able to count 13 different vessels. And so there are sort of two British vessels. There's two or three, uh, sorry, there are two or three British vessels. There were two French vessels. All the rest are, are um, Siamese vessels including warships and gunboats and things like that. So as well as using the eclipse, um, here was a show of political and military power to show that, in fact, show these two British colonial powers that Siam was not able, not only able to carry out calculations to determine where an eclipse was visible, they were able to carry the observations of the eclipse, provide the very best facilities so that serious observations could be made. And also they were able to mount a... Um, military campaign that would outdo the British and the French in that particular location. So let's have a look at Harry Ord. He's an interesting guy too, just like King Rama IV. <clears throat> so Harry Ord, born in 1819, 1858, born in England, and he was a career soldier, diplomat, and he ended up after other 
um, governorships being governor of the Strait Settlements. And originally, up until that time, the whole area of Malaysia, Singapore, and um, British Borneo had been part and governed by um, the British in India. And then the Brits back in England decided to set up a separate state settlement area and create a headquarters in Singapore and appoint a senior diplomat soldier for that. And he was the one. But he was an arrogant bugger and an unpopular diplomat. And if you read all of the accounts, and particularly you go to the original newspapers, which Daruni Ling and I did when we spent um, a week or so going through all the records in the archives in the library in Singapore, it's fascinating to read about him. Because um, at that time, um, the whole Malaysian peninsula was controlled by the British. And there was internal war going on between two different um, Chinese operated factions to try and get control of the very lucrative tin mines. And it was assumed that Harry Ord, being a soldier, would just go in there and he'd solve all those problems. But he wasn't interested. He was interested in carrying out a whole range of other reforms. And um, and he also ended up rub rubbing many of the, um, of the business people the wrong way because he didn't support what they were doing and he wanted to tax them and all this sort of thing. His only major legacy, apart from his eclipse observations, was the Istana. And we've got a photo of that at the top right. This is this magnificent building, which he felt was befitting someone of his stature, of his regal stature. And by the time this was finished, he had a regal stature because he was Sir Harry Ord. And he insisted on being called His Excellency before he was Sir Harry. And after that, then everyone had to bow to Sir Harry and his wife. He was very much a stickler for um, formality like that. But he wasn't popular, and he ended up being kicked out of um, straight settlements in Singapore quite quickly, and he got shunted off to Australia, to Western Australia, which would have been another shock for the system. Um, but anyway, while he was there in the Strait Settlement um, Governor, he was invited by King Rama IV to come and observe the eclipse. Well, he had no interest in eclipses, no knowledge of eclipses, absolutely nothing whatsoever interest in astronomy. But this was a political opportunity that he could not turn down. So we're suggesting that actually he became Singapore's first eclipse chaser. So this whole idea of going and chasing eclipses around the world to try and take some pretty pictures, or in those days, try and draw some pretty pictures, um, this was invented in Asia by Harry Ord, later Sir Harry Ord. He was Singapore's first eclipse chaser. And he went and he observed the eclipse, beautiful clear skies as we know, because the French recorded that. And he made a whole lot of drawings, and we can see one of those um, shown as an insert to this beautiful picture showing part of the comple comple sorry, compound that was provided by um, King Rama IV for, for him at Wakoa. And so there we've got a prominence, which was the Great Horn, and we've got um, a, another prominence, prominence A shown there. But he went beyond that. He actually went and wrote a book, a little book, um, about his observations, account of a visit to the King of Siam at Wahuan, that's the location that they called their camp. Wakao is where the French were observing. They're about one mile apart. Um, so he was about a mile north of where the French were. And it was on the east coast of the Malayan Peninsula in August 1868 by Sir Harry St. George Ord, commander of the British Empire, governor of the Strait Settlement, blah, 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 blah. And so it goes on. So that's Sir Harry, fascinating fellow, using politics to and astronomy to promote himself, but an astute politician. And even though people complained about his extravagances in terms of building the Astana, even his political enemies uh, were bound to admit that, okay, he left, when he left, um, Singapore, he left a beautiful building, if nothing else. I like it. So what about King Rama IV, his observations? He was an amateur astronomer, so he wanted to observe this thing. 
he carried out observations and one of the teles telescopes that he and his group used is shown there on the bottom left. And <clears throat> the observations unfortunately were of no scientific value at all. But what he was able to do was to prove his politi his, mag sorry, his mathematical acumen to show that he had been able to detect the location of the eclipse pass as accurately as the British and the French had. And he was also able to show that the eclipse followed precisely what he had anticipated following um, British and European Western astronomical um, understanding. So this countered the traditional view, which we can see here in the top and center here, of the of Ra, of Rahu from India, which is one of the gods of the eclipses, gobbling up the sun during an eclipse. So that was the view that what was happening was either it was a serpent or it was a god that would devour the sun, and then suddenly it would vomit it out, and that's when the eclipse finished, and so you'd have to wait for the next one. So he was able to prove that that was all a load of nonsense. One of the interesting things that is associated with the um, eclipse observations or the eclipse expedition carried out by King Rama IV was Francis Chit. He didn't have that name. At the time, he was a, a photographer with a Thai name. He carried out successful, made successful photographs of the eclipse. And we can see a picture of one of his photographs um, there below um, at the bottom center. And we've got a picture of Francis, after he um, became appointed by the king, who was suitably impressed, um, he became appointed the royal photographer, changed his name to Francis Chit, both of which are English names. But unfortunately, this all happened and he became, um, became the successful photographer after King Rama IV had died because Rama IV was one of many people in his expedition, also in the French expedition, who caught malaria um, during the e eclipse expeditions. All of the people, everybody, um, recovered from malaria except one person. That one person was King Rama IV. So he died in October after contracting malaria on the 18th of August or thereabouts, 1868. So he is an astronomer who paid the ultimate price. He died for the good of his beloved astronomy, not that he would see it that way. <clears throat> um, what we have today <clears throat> to commemorate the observations that were made by King Rama IV, who's also known as King Mongut, that's his second name, because before he became king, when he was a monk, he was known as Prince Mongut, and then once he became king, some people just continued calling the Mongut name. So he was King Mongut or King Rama IV, which was the official name. So at the location, there's a many acres of land now that have been turned into a official government science park called the King Mongut Science Park. We can see the entrance to it um, on the left top. And then we've got a number of different buildings. I've just shown you one, two, three, four of them in these pictures here across the top, um, including one with an observatory with a 16 inch telescope. And there are a whole range of different museums which don't just talk about astronomy, but also this one in the, in the top middle. It's uh, about geology. Um, and there are different, um, different statues and so on, sculpture that um, relate to astronomy, as we can see in the bottom right, the top right there. And then I've got this picture that I took when I was there. I'm actually standing on the beach at Waka, looking along the beach. So out to sea to the right would have been where all the vessels were anchored in 1868. And just in beyond the trees, um, which didn't exist at that time, would have been the what was originally swampy ground with all the malarial mosquitoes where the eclipse camps were built for the for the French and for um, King Mongut, King Rama IV, and also for our friend Harry Ord. So let's just bring this to a close by <clears throat> having a look at what we've discussed. So we've seen a solar eclipse which lasted six minutes, 47 seconds, with the path of totality extending from Aden in the west through to Melanesia, near New Guinea in the west. We've shown that because of the application of new technology of photography, spectroscopy, and polariscopy, 
major breakthroughs were possible in our understanding of the composition and the nature of the corona, the chromosphere and prominences. These alone, even if you don't count the discovery of helium and the coronium green line, these would alone would be enough to indicate that this is a watershed event in the development of solar physics. We had observations made by astronomers in Aden, in India, in Siam, and in the Dutch East Indies, two different locations, what is now Indonesia, basically. But we've only talked about the observations carried out in two of those, in India and in Siam. There are many different stories associated with the different expeditions. I could have picked any one of these dots on this map and could talk for an hour just about that. So the British observed from Aden, which we hadn't talked about at all, from India. There were four expeditions, we've talked about two. And from Borneo, which is um, Dutch East Indies, the French carried out observations from India and Siam. We've talked about both of those, that's good. The Germans observed from Aden, we haven't talked about them, and from Germany, which we haven't talked about. Netherlands, Dutch East Indies, there was one expedition there, which we haven't talked about, but we've published on a whole lot of these. So that brings us to the last of the slides, apart from references and the answers to our quiz. I think you'll agree that what we've talked about is a watershed event in solar physics. We can now decipher what these cryptic symbols mean that we had on our title page. So horizontally, we can see the 1868 eclipse allowed the British and the French astronomers, and we've got the British represented here by Pogson, the French by Janssen, allowed British and French astronomers to make major discoveries in solar physics. And I think those two are the most viable ones. We could actually have changed this slightly, and we could have talked about royalty in the, in the context of Airy. And we could have talked about Airy providing support for, um, for Tennant, for example. So we could have had two pictures there, one of Tennant, one of Airy. So Tennant plus Airy lead to a better understanding of the sun. So we could actually modify the top horizontal strip by putting different people in there. But I've picked the two that I think are most important. And then vertically, if we go down here, we've got vertically, we can see that King Rama IV, here he is there, used this eclipse, which we've got above him, combine that to counter the aspirations of the colonists from Britain and from France. <clears throat> so the eclipse was a political weapon that he used to try and break colonialism. Um, I know that people like Mike are Cambridge graduates and they like to have a bit of mathematics thrown in into different lectures. So I couldn't resist trying to convert this vertical component here into some sort of mathematics. And so what we start is crap and then Thai, if I say kabong crap, that means thank you very much. So the word crap is an important, um, regularly used word in Thai that's used many, many times every day. And it's crap for men and it's crap for women. Um, so it's, it's sex specific. But of course, if you're in England, you'd say crap. So let's be English because we're doing this in London. And crap equals K-R-A-A-P, King Rama Force, astute astronomical project. So if we go and combine crap, let me do this. Can you see the pointer? If we combine crap, that's King Rama IV, with the eclipse, with SE, solar eclipse, we end up with no colonialism. So no colonialism, let's just symbolize that, becomes knock. So I ask you, knock, knock, who's there? And immediately King Rama IV will answer, independent Siam. So with all due respect, Mike, um, I'd like to bring it to an end there. Thank you very much. And let me just show you further reading for those who want to learn about Jules Dance, Jansen, 
Um, there's a paper that um, Françoise Launay published, developed from her book about, her two books about Janssen. And then Mumpuni and Steinecker and I have written about the Dutch observations in 1868. Um, Beeman Nath, we've got his book here um, about helium. We've got a paper by Beeman and myself published in the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage um, about Pogson's observations. So that highlights some of the things I was talking about. And then we've got this paper that originally was published and has been reprinted in 2017 about the British observations by Tennant in India. And then Daruni Lingling and I have published about the French expedition here um, in a book. And we've also published about King Rama IV, Sir Harry Ord, in the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage. Um, and Ben Raksai Suntonsam and I have written about King Rama IV's observations um, of that eclipse in the book that I published this year and lower well, last year. And um, recently, TV, as I call him, has published about Chari, who was the other fellow from Madras Observatory. So there's a whole range of different reading there. And some of these papers, the ones you see, 2021, um, all published in the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage, were actually scheduled for a book that I've got a contract with Springer for that we were meant to publish about the 1868 eclipse, but we can't do the rest of the fieldwork required in India. So um, what we've done is we've taken the chapters that were finished for that book and we've turned them into papers for public and we've published them in the journal. So at least they're in the public domain. So anyone that wants, um, maybe that's going to be available on the website so you can go and pick that up. Now, for those who <clears throat> bothered to address the questions, you can just see if, if you got all late right. So the Jesuits carried out work in Siam in the 1680s, 1680 through to 1688. There was then a coup and the king was also a major astronomer like we've seen with Rama IV, but he got poisoned and got kicked out and all the Brits and all the Europeans and everyone got kicked out. And that was the end of astronomy until basically the 1868 eclipse. Um, totality, is it short, medium, long, or none of the above? It's none of the above. It's very long. It's one of the longest eclipses on record. I think there were only one or two that I'm aware of that are longer than that. So that was a bit of a trick question. And so was number three, the aperture of the Great Meudon refractor. It's actually a twin refractor. There's two telescopes, the big ones, about 32, 33 inches, depending on what you want to say. And the smaller one that's on the same tube attached to it, um, is 24 20 to 25 inches, so twin telescopes. George Bishop's observatory was Regent's Park, London, Airy, George Biddle. Sir William Huggins' observatory was Tulse Hill in London, so we've got London again. Tennant's telescope with made the optics, and the tube assembly and the mounting were made by Browning. They ended up Originally, they worked separately. They ended up pooling their resources and creating Browning Width telescopes, which became famous in the second half of the 19th century amongst amateur astronomers. And finally, the most famous director of the Great Trigonometrical Survey of India was Colonel George Everest, who was only director from 1830 to 1843. But later on, his one of his successors succeeded in convincing the British government to name the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. That name was accepted in 1865, even though Everest himself didn't want it accepted. He thought it was too difficult for the Indians to pronounce that name. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wayne. That was excellent. Fascinating stuff. And as I say, I knew a little bit about the science, but didn't know it at, at all about the context of all this. Uh, Andy, uh, do we have any questions? Thanks, Wayne. Thanks very much. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions, um, if you type them in the um, Q&A or chat on Zoom and the comments on YouTube, we don't have any questions at the moment, but we do have a couple of comments. One from Gerard Gilligan saying, excellent presentation, Wayne, very informative and of great interest. Uh, thank you much. Thank, appreciate thank it. you very much. And, and I look forward to giving a presentation to your society and apologies for the problems I had medically back in February, but I'm recovered, as you can see. 
Yeah, sorry. Um, and, yes, and and then and from then, John Drummond was um, excellent work, Wayne and uh, Ling Ling, very well presented. Yeah, but too. John, John, you're you're prejudiced because if you don't say something nice, I'll go and mark your thesis harder, <laughs> or you won't get co-authors of the next papers. All right. Okay. But no, thank you, John. It's a delight. Sorry to keep you up so late, but it's a delight to see you interested in and learning about things other than New Zealand Comet, which is what John's um, PhD thesis is about. And this is the second lecture that has nothing to do with comets that John's attended in the last couple of weeks. So he attended an ethnoastronomy um, paper about um, some of the work done in Australia uh, on um, on Aboriginal astronomy just a week ago. So John's really broadening his horizons through COVID. And again, this is thanks to the ability to attend these meetings where we can't go in person. And it's, it's been interesting to hear about an eclipse from uh, quite, a, quite a time ago. I've, I've seen a, a few eclipses, including uh, one that was six minutes about six minutes 30, six minutes 40, but it was a uh, kind of oh. patchy cloud, so not so great. Was that 2008, Andy? Uh, 2009. Two, uh, okay. Two, so there, was, there would, were two in China, one, yeah, one year after another. That's right, oh, that's right. 2008. And then, uh, I was trying to wonder, uh, uh, work out, you know, eclipses occur in Saros series, uh, eight, oh, eight, yes. 18, 18 years after, then you get a similar one. So I was trying to figure out which of the modern day eclipses mm. were uh, corresponding to this one in, in, in Thailand. Mm. As far as I can tell, uh, despite being a mathematician, my arithmetic is bad. But I think <laughs> I think it's the eclipse of 2012, which I saw from Queensland, uh -huh. from Cairns, oh. is, is the same Saros series, I think. Mm. And, that uh, was that, one of two that I saw also. So so, we so you have that connection. You have that connection yeah, to the yeah. 1868 well, one eclipse. One of the two that I've seen in my life. Oh, it was a mm, beautiful, yes, beautiful eclipse. Well, I, I was down in Cairns as well, so. Oh, Mr. gosh. Palm Cove. Yeah, I was yeah. at Palm Cove, not that, yeah. Oh, um, wow. Mike, did, Mike did, you, did you enjoy the mathematics at the very end of my presentation? Yes, yes. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, yeah, I was thinking of you when I tried to come up with that. <laughs> and I, I really like the knock-knock who's there. I couldn't yeah. actually read some of this because my I've got this banner across the bottom of the screen, so I was having to go on memory. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, something different. And it's I, nice to talk about eclipses from a viewpoint of just not only the science. I think people forget that there are, you know, there's these human elements and there's a lot more to eclipses. Um, and also people forget that the eclipse chasing began a long time ago. It's not something that's just recent. Mm. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I think it, it, it is. I, I love the cultural aspects of eclipses. They're, they're absolutely fascinating. They're, they're more than just the science. I think they, they affect mm. people in so many different ways. Uh, any, uh, any comments on the YouTube, Andy? Um, nothing on YouTube at the moment. Um, we've got. Just give me a quick look. Uh, am I, um, am Bill, I, wrong, I think, yeah. were you making a comment? Yes, um, the story of King Rama the Fourth sounded very familiar to me. So I, I went off and did a little bit of research while the talk was going on. Um, and he's the chap in The King and I. Oh, yes. But The mm. King and I actually, the, the, tr the true story is really quite different to what you get in The King and I. Um, the, the lady who wrote the book um, was one of two different people who taught King Rama IV and his son. And there was a lot of artistic license in the book, and there was even more mm -hmm. in the film. So, in fact, that film was banned in Thailand because it was just so really? alien to reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's, that's quite true, Bill. Yeah, I should have actually mentioned that. Um, but, you know, that's almost as a sore point with me as um, talking about our friend um, Airy and what he did with, with Pogson. I just think that's disgraceful. Yeah. P P Pogson was very hard done by, wasn't he? He, he, he spent his, I don't think it was, it, it was hard work in the Madras Observatory. He was underfunded and, yeah. uh, and, and didn't receive any recognition for what he did. What he did. And his, his daughter as well, wasn't it? Isis was, uh, was yes. his, his assistant. And she didn't yeah. get anything. She would, they would well, let her in the RAS until 1920. Yeah, but, but she got a, a minor planet mm. named yeah. after her. Mm. So at least there's some compensation. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I want to say, uh, do you know if the Madras Observatory is still there? 
Um, <clears throat> there was actually a photo of the building that's still there, but it's not an observatory. It's part of a meteorological complex. I, I, I was in, in, in Chennai. Chennai, as it's now called, in, uh, in oh, 2012. Chennai, yeah. And I, I, I wanted to try and find the observatory, but I'd done no preparation whatever. So I think it was, uh, it was yes. <laughs> uh, <that> optimistic. Okay. <clears throat> no, the, there are two different sites. So the, the building at the top right is the one that was the observatory when um, Pogson was director. Um, and that building still exists, but it's been modified. It doesn't have domes. It's got no astronomical involvement. It's a meteorological facility for the government. But the original Madras Observatory, which was built much earlier, um, there's the remains of the transit telescope, and there's still some monuments there. Um, that's a different site in Chennai, in Madras. Yeah, we've written about that in some of the other material. Yeah. Say, and I, I suspect with Pogson, it simply was he was just a, wasn't part of the you know this of the Cambridge Circle, which so many others um, were. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The other thing that I found fascinating was that Mr. Pierre's observations. Do, do we do we know what that might have been? Whether or not it was something co something coincidental or. Um, or something eclipse related. It, it sounds, you know, if it started when the, the sun was only two tenths covered, that doesn't, that doesn't sound to oh, me so too much. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah I, I need to follow that up. I mean, I found that interesting, but I've just been so busy with other, mm. other work, I haven't pursued it. It's, it's an atmospheric phenomenon that I, I would hope other people with more interest in, uh, you know, in shadow, shadow paths and that sort of thing might. Might yeah. want to follow up I, as a, as I, I, am I am interested in that sort of thing, and in, in these, uh, the, and I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on something that it might have been. It's very, uh, I'll, it will. If you send me, the, send me the quote, and I can try and we can try and figure out what it might have been. Um, this is this one here. Yeah. Yeah. When you said Pierre, I'm thinking of mm. Jensen. Yeah. And I was flicking through to the Jensen <laughs> slide. Yeah, this is weird. This must be really amazing because you've got the full range of colours of the rainbow, but there's a gradation in the intensity of the colours. Mm. And didn't... they always reappear at the same spot and in the same sequence, but the intensity varies um, from one um, observation to the next. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. But I have read that this has been observed a few other times when I was reading about this, um, that comment was made. Okay, any, mm. any more questions or comments? <coughs> I think uh, we will, uh, unless there's any more, please put them in the chat if you do, if you do want to say, uh, but if, if not, then I will uh, conclude the proceedings for today. Thank you so much, Wayne. That was excellent. You're welcome. I think, I think we Thank all. Thank you learned, very much. Yeah, I think we all learned a lot. Of, well, first of all, about the science and the, uh, and then about the the, the history and the, the politics of the of the period. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, I actually look forward to, uh, to uh, seeing you again for the talking to the SHA in a few months time. So uh, if we give yes. that sort of virtual round of applause to Wayne from the, yeah. from everybody. Uh, Thank you so much for everybody who attended, and uh, th thank you too. I'm, I'm sure there will be more uh, who've been enjoying this Sunday afternoon and, and, and watch it later on on the uh, on the on the BAA YouTube channel. So hello to you all too, and um, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, maybe see some of you at the next BAA meeting in in a week on Wednesday. Thank you all. Bye bye.